All right, thanks, and welcome to lecture number four in uh, module seven. Um, today we're going to be talking about brain and language. Really, we're going to be talking about um, brain damage and how it can disrupt language. Uh, primarily, uh, we refer to language as a left hemisphere task. That's for people who are right-handed. Um, people who are left-handed will oftentimes have their uh, language centers either in the right hemisphere or most likely will um, be bilateral, but 95% of us have uh, our language primarily contained in the left hemisphere. So uh, we're going to talk primarily about different types of language disorders, uh, particularly what we call aphasia. Aphasia is the disruption of language by some sort of brain-related disorder. Primarily we're talking about hemorrhagic stroke. Um, there are a number of arteries in the left hemisphere that uh, have the potential to be disrupted by stroke. Uh, or other uh, cerebrovascular incident, and this tends to be how uh, language gets disrupted. Uh, it can be very specific to different language systems, and so that can actually oftentimes tell us a lot about the different parts of the brain and how they're responsible uh, for language. So uh, when we talk about this, we often talk about, of course, uh, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Um, the auditory cortex is an important part of this. The motor parts of the brain are uh, important parts of this as well. So Wernicke's area is primarily involved in uh, language comprehension, coming here from the auditory cortex and even often from the visual cortex. Uh, that information can combine, and so what we hear can be related to what we see as well. Uh, that information then gets communicated uh, potentially to Broca's area if we're trying to then respond or repeat what somebody said, which is um, how we um, create spoken language, which is tied directly here in with the motor cortex areas of the brain. So we're going to talk primarily about this sort of top part of this box, Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, conduction aphasia, anomia, which is often called pure word blindness, pure word deafness, uh, alexia, and agraphia. Um, sorry, alexia is often times referred to as pure word blindness. Anomia is a loss of word finding. Uh, a calculia we won't talk much about, but it is also symbolic related and is a loss of mathematical abilities. Um, and then, of course, we've already talked about agnosia and prosopagnosia. So let's get started with Broca's aphasia. Uh, individuals with Broca's aphasia have trouble speaking fluently, but their comprehension can be relatively preserved. They have difficulty in language production. So this is usually called non-fluent or expressive aphasia because they have an inability to fluently express themselves. So uh, this is a, an inability to really speak what you are trying to convey. Uh, damage tends to be in the left inferior prefrontal area. This is often called Broca's area. Not a uh, precise area in every brain, but in that sort of left inferior prefrontal area. Generally, uh, as you can see here, pretty large um, area that can contain Broca's area. I do want you to, to note uh, this diagram. We're going to look at it quite a bit. Um, the large area that sort of con contains what we might call Wernicke's area and the way that they're connected. Uh, because disruptions in all of these areas can result in different types of aphasia. I uh, also notice that uh, Wernicke's area has inputs from the auditory cortex and the visual cortex. That then is conveyed to Broca's area, which then goes on to the motor cortex. So damage to um, this uh, left inferior um, prefrontal area uh, tends to be called Broca's area, and again, this results in Broca's aphasia or what's called expressive aphasia. Wernicke's aphasia, uh, in this form of aphasia, the ability uh, to grasp the meaning of spoken words and sentences is impaired. Uh, Wernicke's aphasia is also referred to as receptive aphasia. This can also cause disruption in reading uh, and uh, visual comprehension. Uh, damage is generally in the superior temporal lobe there at the temporal parietal junction. So if we look here, you can see Wernicke's area is there um, in the anterior superior. <laughs> Um, temporal lobe right there uh, at the conjunction with the parietal lobe. And sometimes even can uh, be thought to contain parts of the parietal lobe. Uh, so this is an inability to understand spoken language and again oftentimes some inability to um, understand written language which we would refer to as alexia. Conduction aphasia then is an acquired language disorder. It is characterized by intact auditory comprehension fluent yet paraphrasic speech production but poor speech repetition. So essentially what we have here is a disconnection between Wernicke's area and Broca's area. Um, that's why it's called conduction aphasia because 
uh, information can't be conducted from Wernicke's area to Broca's area. And so that speech comprehension area is intact. We understand the speech. We can create our own speech, but we can't repeat what somebody says back to us. And so that's this connection between the two. What this tells us about uh, particularly speech language is there's a, an area for comprehension, an area for production, and connections between the two uh, that can uh, cause different types of disruption. So those are the sort of general spoken um, language types of aphasia. There's also what's called pure word deafness. This is the selective inability to comprehend the spoken word. In the absence of aphasia or with defective hearing, uh, and is defined as uh, pure word deafness or auditory verbal agnosia. So essentially, uh, remember in agnosia, there's an inability to recognize objects. In pure word deafness, it's an inability to recognize words uh, as words. And so uh, this isn't um, an inability to comprehend language generally, but an inability to process individual words. And so it's a complete um, inability to comprehend language. Uh, anomia is a condition characterized by difficulty retrieving words. Individuals with anomia often use <laughs> circumlocution, sorry, uh, wording and indirect language to express an idea when they're unable to retrieve the desired word or words. This is a lexical access problem. We talked about this with agnosia because um, this demonstrates a connection between the recognition part of the brain and the connecting it with the language part of the brain. And so people with anomia have an inability to connect an idea, either an internally generated one or an external stimulus, with its name or its word. So uh, literally, anomia is translated from Latin as without names. So it's an inability to name things, so to come up with the word you're thinking of. Now, some of us have a little of this now and then. We have just difficulty finding the right word for something. Um, and you see some of this as we get older, um, but uh, this is a complete loss of that ability. So uh, you can see the lecture on agnosia to see how this ties in uh, with things like pattern recognition. Finally, we get to alexia and agraphia. Alexia is the loss of the ability to read and is often referred to as pure word blindness. So this is people who have had the ability to read and lose that ability and are generally thought of to have um, a visual recognition disorder. Uh, agraphia is loss of the ability to write. Uh, what's surprising is you can be alexic but not agraphic, meaning you can uh, write but you can't read what you have just written. And so these are distinct uh, neural pathways involved in reading and writing. We sort of oftentimes treat them as two sides of the same coin but they are actually entirely different neural systems. So that's a quick introduction to uh, different types of aphasia. I wanted to flip the script a little bit here and talk about um, bilingualism and brain development and talk a little bit about its importance. Uh, first of all, bilingual adults recover more easily from strokes. Um, so there is a great deal of data on how being bilingual benefits us, uh, our health and our cognitive abilities. And so I wanted to just demonstrate give you a list of some of that information. Bilingual adults show increased gray matter. Uh, they show reduced rates of dementia and later onset uh, symptoms for those that do develop dementia. Uh, bilingual children show greater cognitive flexibility. And uh, the benefits for being bilingual can be seen as early as 18 months. And so being raised in a bilingual household is actually a net advantage. So we have a lot of discussion uh, about uh, language development and uh, developing programs uh, to increase bilingualism, and I think they're important because they do provide a great deal of benefits. So here's kind of a summary of uh, the um, types of tasks that have been shown to be benefited by being uh, bilingual. So uh, learning a second language or a third language uh, certainly has a number of benefits, and I think it's something to think about. That gets us to the end of brain and language. Uh, the next lecture will be on drugs and cognition, and then that will round out uh, this uh, module.